Hello. It's good to see you again. Why don't you uh, grab a seat? I was a man with a plan, but plans are bound to fail sometimes. So let me tell you how things have been going for me. Remember how last time I mentioned that we needed support for things like multiple materials, shaders and so on? Well, I set out with a plan. Spoiler alert, it didn't go as planned. Uh, this video is going to be chaos. The plan went like this. I make a planetary simulation that is easily multi-threaded. I run some performance tests. I then implement the new entity component system style architecture and compare the results. So, did it all go according to plan? Of course not. I mean, my brain level is displayed in the video title. I had a grand idea of adding all of these new features to the engine and drawing comparisons. Comparing what exactly? I mean, the functionality is going to be entirely different, so just like comparing apples to oranges, this was pointless. Anyway, what I learned from this is that first I should implement the new architecture and ignore the performance. Of course, I realized that only after I implemented the physics simulation, but hey, on the bright side, the simulation turned out to be awesome, and we will definitely revisit it in the future videos. If someone wants to check it out, I left a branch called Particle Sim, since I will be removing it due to it using different architecture. So why do we even need a new architecture? Here's a problem I ran into during making the planetary simulation. Imagine we have a sphere, right? But we want the sphere to have physics attributes like mass, velocity and acceleration. We could define a physics class and make the sphere inherit those attributes. A physics sphere, if you will. We'd still keep the regular sphere class without the physics component, since we might want a sphere without physics. Okay, now let's say we also want the sphere to make a trail as it travels across space. Now we need another class that inherits both, physics and trail features. And you already can see where this is going. For each combination of features, we'd need a separate class. This could result in thousands of classes in the game, but I digress. There is no perfect solution to this problem, but I chose Entity Component System Architecture simply for the reason of me thinking that it's cool and interesting. Before diving into the ECS architecture, let's talk about a concept called Data-Oriented Design. Data-Oriented Design essentially means that a program is designed in a way where data is stored contiguously or in order, so that when performing updates, consecutive memory read operations by the CPU result in some of the memory being cached already. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, no worries, let me explain in more detail how CPU deals with memory. Imagine we have our CPU that performs all the calculations. CPUs have a type of short-term memory known as cache. There are multiple levels of cache, each with its own speed and purpose. Outside the CPU, we have the main roaming access memory, commonly known as RAM or DRAM. Here's where the gains happen. When the CPU reads from its cache, it's extremely fast. This is in the realm of 1 or 2 CPU cycles fast for level 1 cache, which in seconds is around 0.00000000003 seconds. And we are comparing it to something like 100 CPU cycles when reading from DRAM, a hundred times slower operation, so ideally we want to maximize memory reads from cache. Imagine you have a campfire, and 5 minutes away there's a pile of logs. To keep the fire burning, you could go back and forth each time bringing one log, but that would be stupid. Knowing that you will need more than one log, you would grab as many as you can carry, throw one into fire, and keep the rest near the fire. It will take you almost the same amount of time, since most of the time will be spent walking anyway. This is an analogy to how the CPU works. Say you need to read a float from the memory, which is 4 bytes. The CPU won't just read 4 bytes, just like how you wouldn't fetch just one log. Having made the trip to the DRAM log pile, it will grab more, let's say 64 bytes, do the calculation with the float, and keep the rest nearby in the cache. By knowing this, we can implement applications where CPU cache usage is maximized. In other words, we can follow a data-oriented design, which could be extremely fast. In 
terms of code, it would mean arranging data sequentially, so the CPU caching mechanism is actually useful. This also means that updates should be done in order by component type and not at random. Let us go back to analyzing the actual architecture. Simply explained, Entity Component System is an architecture based on three things. Entities are just identifiers, often some sort of an integer number type. More about them in a bit. We also have components that are pure data containers without any functionality. Components are what we want to store contiguously to follow the data-oriented design. And lastly, systems are what use the component data to do the stuff. In other words, the functionality. They take in the component data and execute the code, meaning they are designed in a way so that they receive components that are stored elsewhere rather than storing anything themselves. Let's get back to entities. The entity identifiers we talked about act as labels to mark relations between entities and components and are used to identify which components make up an entity. This allows us to pull the needed components together and pass this data for the systems. So, when we want an entity to have, let's say, a transform, we link the entity identifier to a transform component. This way, we know which data belongs or rather is accessible by which entities, despite the entities not storing anything themselves. In addition to this, there is nothing preventing sharing a single component between multiple entities, such as different geometries sharing the same material. Having said all that, I must admit, I had no idea where to start implementing the entity component system. Understanding how a car works and actually driving it are two completely different things. This has been hands down the worst struggle in my small YouTube journey so far. I initially buried myself reading the ECS articles. By the way, I will link all the resources in the description in case you want some interesting reads yourselves. At one point, feeling confident, I started writing my own code. I must say, it would be an understatement to say that it went wrong. One minute, I am nodding while reading the guides, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do this, write that, and then at one point, I looked at my code, which had a void pointer storage system, and I was like, okay. Maybe, just maybe, it's time to admit once again that I am dumb and can't replicate a well-designed implementation right off the bat, just by reading a few articles. When dealing with difficult problems like this, I think it's better to understand why the code does something, rather than how it does it. Following this mindset, I accepted that a simpler implementation will have to suffice, since I don't have the skills to write a masterpiece and will have to improve on a simpler solution instead. I more or less followed what the existing implementations do, but thought of my own solution on how to do it. I went through many iterations, but the video would be a few hours long if I went through every failure, so let's skip to the final ECS implementation for this video. Entities just store an identifier. For now I mark IDs as integers, but really this could be any integer number type. A component is just pure data with the methods for that component type and also an identifier. I store each component type in a separate C++ vector. You may be wondering, do vectors store memory contiguously, despite having a dynamic size? Yes. So we could utilize the caching mechanism if we wanted. Using vectors is not ideal, however, since we can dynamically store the different components in one single vector, because vectors need to know what types they will store at compilation time. This results in needing to rewrite code for each component type, and I think that the void pointer storage system I mentioned before likely solves this very issue in one of the articles. But let us worry about that later, because I do not want to completely stall my progress on the engine by trying to make this perfect from the start. Alongside the component vectors, we have a mapping that links the entity ID to component index in the component vector. This way, we can instantly check if an entity has a component rather than iterating over the entire component vector. And lastly, we have the systems that would manipulate the component data passed by reference from the world. Oh, did I not mention? The master class that manages entities, components and systems is called world. Having an idea for a basic ECS system 
we are going to need to repurpose our instance renderer and turn it into an instance rendering system. Prior to making any ECS related changes, I decided to clean up any code related to DirectX constant buffers that was still in application level code and transfer it to the rendering system. I think the same will have to be done with shaders in the future, I left it alone for now. Since systems by design do not store any data, we need to query our components every frame to find which entities have a transform, a mesh and material. Since we use hash maps to link entity IDs to component indexes inside of the vectors, the search to check if an entity has a component of specific type is basically 01. We just check for entities that have all three of the components and submit their data to a rendering pool. We could have ended here, however, I made a little improvement by adding a dirty flag on the transform components that sets itself to true internally once the transform data has been updated. This way, we can only update the transformation data in the rendering pool only when the entity has moved rather than every frame. The main concern with this type of querying is that with increasing component counts, the entity component relation searching, despite the fast lookup times of hash maps, will get expensive. However, there is a way around this by using something called component archetypes. This is actually pretty similar to how we currently look if an entity has a component. We would create some sort of mapping for each existing component combination and would check what type of combination the entity has. At the time when I was writing the script for this video, I was already working on the upcoming video where I was experimenting with real-time editing tools. And when deleting the entities, the hash maps that we use to find the component indexes proved to be a bit complicated. I actually started working on a complex solution that involved keeping deleted components as dead memory and clearing it when certain conditions were met, but with no large-scale project to test if it was even efficient, I instead chose to go with a simple solution of just remapping the indexes after the component has been removed. We will likely need something smarter in the future, but this is great for now. Anyway, I made a small sample scene with 100 cubes with different materials that use the entity component system architecture. I know, I know, this is not very impressive visually, but we are using an entirely different architecture. I feel like we've set quite a solid baseline to improve upon, and while it took me devastatingly long to code this, I really had fun with it, and I am sort of proud of myself despite the shortcomings. So what's next? Hmm. Well, I think it's time to move to the editor side, just as I spoiled. Creating a basic world manager that allows the creation and deletion of primitive objects in runtime using a user interface would be quite nice for a start, and I will start looking into serialization options for C++ for saving and loading the worlds. This was quite a blast. I hope you enjoyed watching this just as much as I enjoyed making this, and maybe even learned something new. If so, please drop a like and subscribe if you wish to see more like it. See you next time! Thank you.